This week's episode is presented by 1895 Films and our content partners. Peter Hamilton's Documentary Business, a newsletter for documentary professionals, and Sunny Side of the Doc, the international marketplace for documentary and narrative experiences, coming to La Rochelle, France in June 2022. How do you interview a former member of the royal family? The tape recorder was plonked in front of them in full view so that they knew exactly what was happening. And I would say that is the stop button. If there's anything you don't want to say, just press it. That's Anne de Courcy, author of Snowden, the Biography, a book about Lord Snowden, otherwise known as Antony Armstrong Jones, the photographer who married Princess Margaret in 1960. We'd sit and chat in his studio for a bit. And then he'd say, would I like a cup of coffee, which I always did. He very often would have a glass of white wine. And we would chat away. And sometimes he'd show me photographs. Were you nervous at the thought of marrying the princess? Um, she was just a person. Look how beautiful she was. Beautiful? Um, yes. Let's have a drink. I'm Tobias Black, and this is Artifactual from 1895 Films. Making documentaries is hard. Making documentaries entirely out of archival material is really hard. No matter how good a story is, if the material isn't there, you can't tell it. You can't fall back on a narrator or an interview with an expert to bridge any gaps. So why does 1895 Films specialize in documentaries made entirely out of archival material? It's a great question. Audio is where this gets really tricky. It's much easier to find visuals for great audio than it is to find audio for great visuals. If you don't have audio, you don't have a story. So one trick we've learned is to ask nonfiction writers if they've taped interviews in the course of their work. Most writers think of their tapes as research material to get filed away when a piece is published. Sometimes they even get destroyed. Tapes take up valuable closet space, and digital files take up valuable hard drive space. But to us, these tapes are gold. In the fall of 2019, 1895 Films began research for Being the Queen, an archive-driven documentary telling the story of Britain's longest reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. This was a challenge because, as we soon discovered, the Queen has given a grand total of one interview in her entire life. So after breathing into a paper bag for a few minutes, we got to work. We started with a list of books about the royal family or anybody connected with them. One of the books on that list was called Snowden the Biography by Anne de Courcy. It was about Princess Margaret's husband, Antony Armstrong Jones, formerly known as Lord Snowden after their marriage, but known to many as Tony. I emailed Anne, ready to have my hopes crushed once again, and asked if she had tapes of any of her interviews. Her response couldn't have been better. Oh, I have them in a large carrier bag in a cupboard. (laughs) Jackpot. It turned out that Anne had recorded all of her interviews for the book on cassette tapes. No one except Anne and anyone who had helped her transcribe the interviews had ever heard them. The only problem? Anne was in London. We were all in Los Angeles. So we got in touch with a London-based researcher and archive expert named Hugh Pinney. He went over to Anne's home in London to retrieve the tapes. They were literally in a shopping bag, in a kind of, you know, supermarket plastic bag. She had nothing really to play them on. We just had to go through them one by one. And uh, she would just then tell me the background to each to each interview, how, who it was, why they were important, how she'd got the interview. And how Anne got the interviews turned out to be a story in itself. I really first got to know Tony when I was working on the Daily Mail. Tony, remember, is Anthony Armstrong Jones. I read somewhere that he was going to Siberia and taking photographs and things there. And so I dropped him a line saying that the paper would be very interested indeed to hear about his trip when he got back. And he rang me up straight away and we had lunch. And I also realized that nobody had ever written a proper biography of him. And he was famously discreet. He never talked. And so it sounded a rather impossible project. But I just, it attracted my attention very much indeed. And I thought there must be a way in. And one day I suggested it to him. I said, you've led a very colourful life and I would treat your life very responsibly. Would you have a think about it? Because I would love to write your biography. And he just looked out of the window and didn't answer. And then at the end of, I suppose, about a year, 
I tried again. I said, Tony, it's look out of the window time again. And a faint smile twitched the corners of his mouth. I said, I'm going to go back to the office. I'm going to write you a letter stating all the reasons. I think I'm the person to write your biography. And uh, if you don't want it, just tell me. But I would like an answer. I wrote the letter. I dropped it through his front door. I got a uh, postcard from him saying, don't you think it would be frightfully boring? So I sent another postcard back saying, please never use the word boring in connection with yourself. That sealed it. Anne received an invitation to Tony's home. He then sent me a third postcard saying, would you like to come round and look at my files? Well, I assumed that was a yes. So I turned up and he had a lovely house in Launceston Place uh, in Kensington. Uh, a very beautiful one, and it was lovely inside. Tony has had enormous taste. He let me look at all his files. He had a whole room full of these files, all beautifully bound in scarlet leather. There's quite a lot of red in the house. He had designed the chairs for Prince Charles's investiture, which were a wonderful scarlet. He'd got two or three in his house. And we'd sit and chat. And from then on, I went round once a week for about two years with my little tape recorder, We would have a cup of coffee first, we would chat, and then I would switch the tape recorder on and he would talk. It's really all right for my session with Tony. Um, How old were you when you learned to drive? When I was 16, I had my first motorbike license. Was that before you had polio? Um, No, at the same time, because I was in Wales when I, with, with the motorbike. And I got, got this terrible backache, and I thought it was because I'd been heaving the very heavy bike up. And that was the start. And then I was driven off to um, Liverpool um, and stayed in the Royal Family in Liverpool for a year. By taping her interviews, Anne ensured the accuracy of her book. Well, I always... It was the days of old-fashioned tape recorders with tapes, and I've always interviewed subjects like that because... Afterwards, there is no question of of your accuracy. But taping her interviews also required a strong sense of trust between Anne and her interview subjects. My technique was always, whoever I talked to, the tape recorder was plonked in front of them in full view so they knew exactly what was happening. And I would say, that is the stop button. If there's anything you don't want to say, just press it. Or tell me, and I'll run the tape back slightly. Because... You have to be fair and square with people. I think and hope they just trusted me. Anthony Armstrong Jones was born in 1930, and by 1956 he was already a well-established photographer. He was a very good photographer indeed. He pioneered a sort of new way of photography with a small camera, He took photographs very quickly, which is essential if you don't want the subject's expression to freeze. So he really was a very good photographer indeed. And he was at the top of his profession before he even met Princess Margaret. One important early commission was to take photographs of the wedding of Lady Anne Cook to the Honorable Colin Tennant, who was to become the third Baron Glen Connor. You don't really have to remember all that, except that we'll be referring to this Anne as Lady Anne Glen Connor to distinguish her from Anne de Courcy, author of the Snowden biography. Both halves of the couple were close to Princess Margaret. Colin had been the princess's escort, and Lady Anne was one of Margaret's oldest friends and would become one of her ladies-in-waiting. Here's part of Anne de Courcy's interview with Lady Anne Glenconnor. You bet, Chris, knew everything for Lady Glenconnor, and I hope it's going to work, don't you? Good, good girl. Um, well, Tony, he's called Tony Armstrong Jones, in 1956, came and took my wedding photographs at Holcomb. And my father used to call him a Tony Snapshot. She has known Princess Margaret intimately, really all her life. And uh, the princess was enormously fond of her. I think uh, couldn't have managed without her. I think uh, that people always say that he first met Princess Margaret at my wedding because in, in a very professional way. So I don't think they, they, they didn't they see didn't meet as a sort of social couple, no. kind of thing. But, but he, I, they did meet there, I think that's probably the first time. 
And uh, he was treated very professionally. I mean, you know, no, no having lunch with us or something like that. <laughs> he had to go out in a way he had lunch for them. But he did take the most ravishing photographs. He was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. Tony and Margaret met again a few years later at a dinner party held by another of Margaret's ladies-in-waiting, Elizabeth Cavendish. Here's writer Anne de Courcy again. Well, their very first meeting was through Lady Elizabeth Ca- Cavendish, who was the princess's lady-in-waiting. And Princess Margaret had been rather down in the dumps. Lady Elizabeth wanted to cheer the princess up. Tony could be frightfully funny and very charming. He was a real asset at a party when he was in a good mood. So she thought she'd give a small dinner party. And she gave it in her mother's flat. The Dowager Duchess of Devonshire had a flat overlooking the embankment. And Tony was asked, and so was the princess. There were only six people there. And... They got on famously, but they didn't, as it were, click. I think the princess said afterwards she thought he was gay. Um, And then nothing happened for a bit. And then one of the princess's admirers said to her, could he have a photograph of her? He longed for a really lovely photograph of her, and he knew exactly the person to take it. He said, there's a new young photographer called Anthony Armstrong Jones. Could you let me, ma'am, arrange sitting and she said fine and along comes Tony he in a most charming way bossed the princess around and got some lovely photographs with which she was very pleased and she liked him and that time they really did click here's Lady Anne Glen Connor again I thought that they were tremendously well suited mm-hmm. they seemed very happy mm-hmm. and um, they, they, they seemed I, I thought they were sort of ideally suited really But the public didn't know about the relationship yet. Margaret had been burned by the press in the past, and she and Tony kept their relationship secret. People didn't sort of notice him. He was under the radar. And he would have been an unexpected one, but everyone expected that she would marry some duke or other, you see, and a a photographer. They didn't kind of think about it. So they were able to have that courtship completely in secret. Here's Tony talking about the beginning of his relationship with Margaret. Yes, we did come, become very fond of each other. Yes. I mean, quite soon, or did it take a time? Not um, quite so much. Yes. Um, and obviously this must have been quite different in quality and kind from your feelings about other people before. Was it wound up in, in marriage? Yes. Can't remember. I have to say, you sometimes get more of the famously discreet Tony than the charming or outrageous Tony in these recordings. But Anne de Courcy did her best to draw him out. What appealed most? What do you think? You had great fun. Obviously, the princess was extremely beautiful, which would attract any young man. Um, she was fun. She was bright. She bright as a button. On May 6, 1960, Princess Margaret married Anthony Armstrong Jones in Westminster Abbey. It was the first royal wedding to be televised. Through cheering crowds of hundreds of thousands, Princess Margaret rides to Westminster Abbey on her wedding day. Two thousand guests in multicolored splendor await, as does the bridegroom, untitled Anthony Armstrong Jones. His father sits on the opposite side of the sanctuary from the royal family. The couple weren't an obvious match. Margaret, of course, had an old noble lineage, and Tony was a kind of bohemian who seemed to enjoy shocking people. Here's Patrick Anson, the fifth Earl of Litchfield. Lord Litchfield was a close friend of the couple and also a cousin to Princess Margaret and Queen Elizabeth II. He also happened to be a fellow photographer. Tony was... was hip before... Other people were him. He was surprising. That was the great thing about Tony, is that he, I think he liked to surprise at all times. I've always felt uneasy in his presence. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't sit down and have a cozy lunch with him because you'd have to be on your guard. And you know, he does odd, odd things. I mean, he likes to be unconventional. I think sometimes for the sake of it. Mm. When David and I jointly owned a restaurant, he would come in and order 
deliberately things that were not on the menu. I don't actually think Tony's a terribly nice person. Tony and Margaret's relationship was rocky from the start. Here's writer Anne de Courcy again. He was much sharper than her. He could be much uh, ruder and more horrible to her. And the atmosphere in Kensington Palace was often dreadful. People who've worked there have said, you know, it was glacial sometimes, not speaking to each other. She would say to someone, will you ask Lord Snowden to pass the salt, that kind of thing, at the dining table. And he uh, would do the same. Here's Lady Anne Glen Connor, Princess Margaret's lady-in-waiting. I mean, he could be charming, Tony. Mm. Um, but I saw him being so cruel, quite frankly, and unkind to her. Do and it was all the, the horrible little things he did. Putting what? little... He used to write these little messages, and he put them in her glove drawer, and it was... I hate you, you look like a Jewish manicurist. You really did say that. Uh, mm. Gosh. Mm-hmm. And I know she was difficult in lots of ways, Princess Margaret. I used to mind very much because I was so fond of her. She was the most wonderful friend to me. And I minded terribly the way Tony treated her. He had a sort of library next door to the drawing room. Oh, yes. And he, because he was a carpenter, I mean, he made this hole, you know, behind the book so that he could look, spy on her in the drawing room. Anne de Courcy asked Patrick Litchfield what he thought led to the end of Tony and Margaret's marriage. I don't know that if it was if it was um, the affairs. I personally would have said that the simple fact that they were unable to live together without fighting. Yes. Lady Anne Glen Connor tells a story about one of those fights. It was the early 70s, and Princess Margaret was sick. She'd taken too many sleeping pills. She was out of any danger, but her doctors said she needed rest. And those doctors gave Lady Anne the task of guarding Margaret's door against anyone who might disturb her, especially Tony. So Lady Anne is sitting there outside Margaret's bedroom door when she hears Tony coming up the stairs. And he came up sort of limping. He saw me sitting there. And he let go. And he was so appallingly rude. But I went on sitting there. He said, he said I suppose you're uh, stopping me going into her room. Or how dare you want something? And I said, well, look, I've just been asked to do this by the doctor. He said, nobody is going to the room. Tony, it's not just you. He then went down, got into his car. He had a a sort of open car, some car, in that rather small court, courtyard. And he then ripped up his car and he went, run, run, very small court, blowing his head, so she could hear. How awful for her. Margaret and Tony got divorced in 1978. It was the first official royal separation since King Henry VIII annulled his marriage to Anne of Cleves in the year 1540. Thirty years after Margaret and Tony's divorce, Anne de Courcy was completing her interviews, some 96 in all. And now it was time to write. So I had this huge collection of tapes, and at the end of two or three years, it was time to to write. I didn't know how to write this because I'd got so much material, and not all of it was favourable to Tony. I simply didn't know what to do. And I then decided the only way to write the book was to write it as if he was no longer with us. And so the nervous moment came that my editor and I said, and now we must let Tony look at the book. He'd been asking anxiously when it was going to come out. He was clearly very keen on this. And I got a letter from Lady Snowden, actually, Lucy Snowden, saying neither Tony nor I wish to read the book. Go ahead. So we went ahead and published. And... I have to say he wasn't tremendously happy about it afterwards. I think he hadn't realised quite how uh, truthful I would be. Anne de Courcy's book was released in 2008, and a lot of the stories Anne had gathered ended up in the Netflix series The Crown. But Tony's character didn't appear until the second season, released at the end of 2017, 11 months after Tony's death in February of that year. Not that Tony or Margaret would necessarily have felt that their depictions in the show were accurate. 
I watched the first series of The Crown, and I was rather put off because Princess Margaret was played by somebody really quite tall then, and she was incredibly petite. So I suppose the only way to think of it is as a fictional story. I think it is a lot of it fiction, you see. But no one person ever has the whole story anyway. That's one of the reasons Anne ended up interviewing so many other people for this story, burying herself under so many hours of tape. And ultimately, if there's one thing I've learned from making this podcast, it's that you kind of need to bury yourself under those hours of tape to get that one perfect soundbite. Whenever they're talking about something, people always say the same thing three times over, but in a different way. And you just have to boil it down to one particular sentence. And you get so you can tell what's a good quote. You think, gosh, that's gold dust. And the rest is all waffle. And who knows what other gold dust is out there? Other documentaries like the Capote tapes and the Armstrong tapes, both from 2019, have used similar troves of material as their spines. Here's researcher Hugh Pinney again. There should be many more authors looking for plastic bags of tapes under their beds because actually there are, you know, there's, there's really interesting stuff sitting out there. Now all we have to do is find it. Thanks for listening. This episode of Artifactual was written and produced by Will DePanier. It was sound designed and mixed by Fran at 17 Street Audio. Additional production help came from Jane Powell. Our executive producers are Tom Jennings and Ellen Farmer at 1895 Films. If you want to learn more about our documentaries, you can find us on Twitter at 1895films or at 1895films.com. And if you want more Artifactual content, you can visit us at our brand new website, artifactualpodcast.com. Thank you.